Donald Murphy, born 1944, is an American serial killer, sex offender, and bank robber, convicted of murdering two prostitutes in Detroit in 1980. During this time, several similar murders occurred in the city. However, he was convicted of only two with the available evidence, and sentenced to 15 to 30 years imprisonment for each murder. Convicted of only two with the available Moran was born Adelard Cunin to a French immigrant father, Jules Adelard Cunin, and a mother of Canadian descent, Marie Diana Gobiel, in St. Paul, Minnesota. He attended Creighton High School, a private Catholic school in St. Paul, but he also joined a local juvenile gang and left school at age 18. He was later caught robbing a store and was sent to the state juvenile correctional facility, and was put in jail three times before he turned 21. He then fled to Chicago where he was caught trying to rob a warehouse, taking part in a horse-stealing ring, taking part in robbery involving the death of a police officer, and robbing a freight car, for which he received a variety of prison and jail sentences. Prohibition Prohibition was established in 1920 with the enactment of the 18th Amendment, which banned the distribution of alcoholic beverages, resulting in bootlegging. Among the involved gangs were Dean O'Banion and his mostly Irish group, including Bugs Moran, who became known as the North Side Gang and Al Capone as the leader of the Italian mob on the South Side. These two rivals fought violently, resulting in what is known as the Bootleg Battle of the Marne. Battling Al Capone The bootlegging operation of Hemi Weiss and Bugs Moran continued to pose a significant challenge to Capone's South Side Gang. Moran and Capone then led a turf war with each other that cost them both. Moran's hatred of Capone was apparent even to the public. Moran was disgusted that Capone engaged in prostitution. He would not increase profits himself by engaging in prostitution rings because of his Catholic religion. Johnny Torrio's gang killed Dean O'Banion, and in an attempt to avenge him, Bugs Moran and Earl Hemi Weiss made an attempt on Torrio's life. Later they went on to make a failed attempt on Al Capone's life at his headquarters, the Hawthorne Inn in Cicero, Illinois. More than 1,000 shots were fired at the inn and at a nearby restaurant in their attempts to kill Capone. In retaliation, Weiss was killed by Capone's gang, and Moran became the new boss of the North Side Gang. According to historian of Twin Cities organized crime Paul Maccabee, Bugs Moran had a close friendship with St. Paul-based Irish mob boss Danny Hogan. Following Hogan's murder by car bomb on December 4, 1928, Bugs Moran personally stood guard outside the Hogan family residence at West 7th Street in St. Paul, apparently to protect the Hogan family from further underworld attacks. Responding to Weiss's death, Moran tried to kill a member of Capone's gang, resulting in an attack, allegedly from Capone, known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. On February 14, 1929, seven members of Moran's gang died in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Moran was offered a truckload of whiskey at a bargain price, which he had ordered to be delivered at 10.30 a.m. to the garage of the SMC Cartage Company on North Clark Street, where he kept his bootlegging trucks. Two gunmen dressed as Chicago police officers and two others in plain clothes lined up Moran's people against the wall in the warehouse and shot them. The victims included five members of George Bugs Moran's North Side Gang. Moran's second-in-command and brother-in-law Albert Kachalek, alias James Clark, was killed along with Adam Heyer, the gang's bookkeeper and business manager, Albert Weinshank, who managed several cleaning and dyeing operations for Moran, and gang enforcers Frank Gussenberg and Peter Gussenberg. Two associates were also shot, Reinhard H. Schwimmer, a former optician-turned-gambler and gang associate, and John May, an occasional mechanic for the Moran gang. Bugs Moran, the main target of the assassination was not present, having arrived late and saw the approaching police car he turned around going to a nearby cafe instead. Another North Sider, Al Weinshank, was misidentified as Moran by one of the lookouts who signaled for the attack to begin. Police response was delayed when witnesses saw the two police officers exit the scene. There were six corpses and another man near death when police arrived on the scene. The man, Frank Gussenberg, following the gangster's code of silence, refused to identify the killers before dying. Chicago police officers arrived at the scene to find that victim Frank Gussenberg was still alive, despite having sustained 14 bullet wounds. He was taken to the hospital, where doctors stabilized him for a short time and police tried to question him. When the police asked him who did it, he reportedly replied, I won't talk, for God's sake get me to a hospital. He died three hours later.
When Moran learned of the carnage, he broke the gangster code, accusing Capone of the murders. No one was convicted, Capone denying involvement in the massacre, though twice being summoned to court, which he avoided by claimed illness. There is some evidence implicating Chicago police officers in the killings. Prior to the massacre, some officers were stealing bootleg liquor from the gang's trucks and were allegedly disciplined by the chief of police, but no substantiation is available. It has been established that Al Capone was in Florida on the day of the massacre. The perpetrators have never been conclusively identified, but former members of the Egan's Rats gang working for Capone are suspected of involvement. Others have said that members of the Chicago Police Department who allegedly wanted revenge for the killing of a police officer's son played a part. Several factors contributed to the timing of the plan to kill Moran. Moran and Capone had been vying for control of the lucrative Chicago bootlegging trade. Moran had also been muscling in on a Capone-run dog track in the Chicago suburbs, and he had taken over several saloons that were run by Capone, insisting that they were in his territory. Earlier in the year, North Sider Frank Gussenberg and his brother Peter unsuccessfully attempted to murder Jack McGurn. The North Side gang was complicit in the murders of Pascalino Patsy Lalordo and Antonio the Scourge Lombardo. Both had been presidents of the Uni 1 Siciliana, the local mafia, and close associates of Capone. The plan was to lure Moran to the SMC Cartage Warehouse on North Clark Street on February 14, 1929, to kill him and perhaps two or three of his lieutenants. It is usually assumed that the North Siders were lured to the garage with the promise of a stolen, cut-rate shipment of whiskey, supplied by Detroit's Purple Gang, which was associated with Capone. The Gussenberg brothers were supposed to drive two empty trucks to Detroit that day to pick up two loads of stolen Canadian whiskey. Witnesses outside the garage saw a Cadillac sedan pull up to a stop in front of the garage. Four men emerged and walked inside, two of them dressed in police uniform. The two fake police officers carried shotguns and entered the rear portion of the garage, where they found members of Moran's gang and associates Reinhard Schwimmer and John May, who was fixing one of the trucks. The fake policemen then ordered the men to line up against the wall, then signaled to the pair in civilian clothes who had accompanied them. Two of the killers opened fire with Thompson submachine guns, one with a 20-round box magazine and the other a 50-round drum. They were thorough, spraying their victims left and right, even continuing to fire after all seven had hit the floor. Two shotgun blasts afterward all but obliterated the faces of John May and James Clark, according to the coroner's report. After Prohibition, Moran managed to keep control of his territory and what remained of his gang through the early 1930s, but the North Side Gang never fully recovered its power or former place in Chicago's underworld as the chief rival to Capone's Italian mob. Moran eventually left the area, quitting the gang entirely, though not the criminal lifestyle. He reverted to his earlier gangster ways of petty crime such as mail fraud and robbery. On April 30, 1939, Moran was convicted of conspiracy to cash $62,000 worth of American Express checks. He was freed on appeal when he posted a bond, he fled but was captured and not released until December 21, 1944. He was almost penniless by the 1940s, only 17 years after being one of the richest gangsters in Chicago. On July 6, 1946, he was arrested for his involvement in the robbery of a Dayton, Ohio tavern on June 28, 1945, and he received a sentence of 20 years after being found guilty. He was paroled in 1956, but was immediately arrested for his role in the 1945 robbery of a bank in Ansonia, Ohio. He was found guilty in 1957 and sentenced to 10 more years in prison. Death in Prison Moran died of lung cancer a few months into his 10-year sentence at Leavenworth Federal Prison in Kansas on February 25, 1957, at the age of 63. Donald Murphy is an American serial killer. Donald Murphy, born 1944, is an American serial killer, sex offender and bank robber, convicted of murdering two prostitutes in Detroit in 1980. During this time, several similar murders occurred in the city, presumably committed by two or more killers operating in the area, with Murphy himself confessing to committing at least six of them. However, he was convicted of only two with the available evidence, and sentenced to 15 to 30 years imprisonment for each murder, 